Right in time for Christmas, I received the first prototype boards for the Red Hat++ command station, so I had some time to test them and do some debugging. Here is a first look at the boards and into the functionality of the Red Hat++. Welcome to the IOTT channel, I am Hans Tanner and first of all, a Happy New Year to you and your family. As I normally do when prototyping a new board, I ordered a small series of five PC boards with two of them assembled on one side. In my case, that is the lower side of the board with all the electronic components. I then first installed all the components on the top side of the board, which are the head connector, the IO port connectors, the LockConnect connectors, power, track and programming track connectors and the pigtail for the LED chain. Also on the board are three 3.5mm status LEDs, but I only had either 5mm or 2.5mm types available, which neither fit the soldering footprint, so I bridged the LEDs and used the first three LEDs on the LED matrix instead. The final assembly step was mounting the DC-DC converter and here I was running into the first problem. Obviously the polarity of the soldering pads was wrong, therefore I was not able to install the converter as intended. Instead I had to turn it around and mount it on pins above some other components on the back side of the board. So I had the first error to be corrected for the next version of the board, but luckily it was not the end of the show. The only module I did not install at this point in time was the IBT2 H bridge, as it is pretty bulky and I can test all signals without the bridge being installed. But of course I verified that the opening fits the dimensions of the board and that the connections for power and the control pins can be made without problems once I am ready to install it. Next I used an Arduino with ISP software to burn the bootloader into the Atmega 328P processor. I have described this step in video number 50. The process worked flawlessly at the first try, which meant I was now able to connect directly from the Arduino IDE using an FTDI programmer and a regular USB connection, so I can use the same process to program the Atmega 328P you are used to from the Arduino Uno or Nano. I simply selected Arduino Nano with the old bootloader and was able to load a simple sketch like the typical strand test sketch for WS2812 LEDs and run it from the 3.3V or 5V power supplied by the FTDI programmer. Proof that the processor on the board is running. That was quite a relief I must say and of course it meant that I now could start testing the functions of the board pretty much following the functional diagram I showed you in the last video. The first function block was the power supply manager. Looking at the schematics it is obvious that I wanted to keep the high current power path as simple as possible. In particular I was not interested in running the current through protection diodes which can generate a lot of heat. So I chose a different approach. From the input connector both poles run through a simple on-off relay straight to the H-bridge. No diode, no rectifier, nothing. Of course the downside of this is that there is no protection against reverse polarity or if someone connects an AC power supply to the input. To deal with that problem I ran a second branch from the input connector to a bridge rectifier and then to the DC-DC converter. From there the 5V output is then used to power the 5V circuitry of the board and to supply the IoTT stick. The stick in turn then powers up and supplies the 3.3V circuit which powers up the Atmega 328P processor. 
The third and final element is a high impedance voltage sensor on the input signal, so that I can use the software of the Atmega to determine if the supply voltage is DC with the correct polarity and in an acceptable voltage range, which can be set in software. Right now I have selected values between 12 volts and 25 volts DC, which covers all the major scale standards. If the program determines that the applied voltage is correct, it then activates the power relay so that the H bridge is supplied and the command station is ready. In the next step, I installed the DC++ X signal generator and verified that the processor started to generate the DCC signals to the IBT2 H bridge. Looking at the schematics, we see that the output signals for the track are wired to a selector chip, which allows for selecting either the DCC signals from the processor or those from the Loconet connector pins 1 and 6 to go to the booster. The source is chosen by a GPIO pin labeled SELECT BOOSTER and SELECT COMMAND STATION. These two signals are just inverted, so one is always low while the other one is high. The default with the processor pin low is SELECT COMMAND STATION, so the DCC signal should make it straight through to the H bridge and indeed that's what I saw on the oscilloscope. I then activated SELECT BOOSTER and the DCC signal on the oscilloscope stopped, indicating that both the processor and the selector circuit are working properly. The programming signal from the processor is amplified by the onboard L298 dual H bridge chip, so that was the next module I tested. From the L298, the amplified program track signal runs through a relay to the programming track output of the board. The relay allows the programming track output to select the output signal from either the IBT2 main booster or the L298. With that approach, it is possible to have a special track section on the layout where you can, can drive on with a locomotive using DCC and then switch the mode of the track and do service mode programming without having to remove the locomotive from the main track. When done, the block is switched back to main track and the locomotive can continue running on DCC. The relay is activated by another output of the processor, so I tested that as well and it worked as intended. The next block to look at was the Loconet interface, which actually is the most complex function block of the hardware. The first part is the Loconet interface itself. This is basically the same circuit as used for the Loconet breakout board, only that it is integrated in the board. And since the Red Hat++ is based on the IoTT stick, I still make use of the Grove port, so the Loconet communication is sent via a 50mm Grove port cable to the other side of the stick. That part was relatively simple, except that it did not work. <laughs> for some reason, incoming messages would not make it to the stick. As it turned out, I forgot the power supply wire to the comparator chip and therefore the Loconet signal was not sent to the stick. So I found another error in my design, but again, it was easy to fix a short piece of wire soldered to a 3.3 volt point, did do the trick, and the Loconet interface was working properly. The more complex part was dealing with pins 1 and 6 on the Loconet connector, so the low power DCC signal in the Loconet cable. In command station mode, these two wires need to be supplied with a low energy DCC signal to provide power to throttles and other Loconet devices. In booster mode, the low power DCC signal comes from the external command station and needs to be used to detect the DCC signal and send it to the booster. So the work mode is completely different depending on whether the device works as command station or as booster. Looking at the schematics, it becomes clear how this functionality is implemented. 
In booster mode, the incoming DCC signal is processed through a set of high impedance comparators followed by voltage level adjustment to make it a nice 3.3 volt DCC rectangle waveform. This signal is then sent to the selector I discussed earlier, where it is selected when the device is in booster mode. In command station mode, the signal ends here and is not used for anything else. In command station mode, the second bridge of the L298 is enabled to amplify the DCC signal generated by the processor, so it works in parallel with the IPT2, but of course with much lower current limit. The output of the L298 is then run to wires 1 and 6 of the Loconet cable, where it can be used to power Loconet devices like throttles that are connected to the network, according to the Loconet specifications. To test the functionality, I install the IoT T-Stick on the board and power up the board in command station mode. I now can connect a throttle to the Loconet outlet and it powers up, which means that pins 1 and 6 of Loconet are powered as they should. Furthermore, when I use the knobs on the throttle, I see the Loconet LED on the IoT T-Stick blink, indicating that messages are flowing. So I try to assign a locomotive and send speed commands to it. In the Arduino viewer, which shows the data traffic between the IoT T-Stick and the Arduino processor, I see the DCC++ API messages sent by the stick and then the return messages coming from the Red Hat++ board. So this is working. Next, I power the board in booster mode and connect an external Loconet to it. In this mode, the DCC++ signal generator is not activated, but the IBT2 should get the input signal from the incoming Loconet via the comparator and level adjuster. And indeed, when looking at the PWM signals for the IPT2, I see a nice 33 volt DCC square wave as expected. The last function group to test is the I.O. connector bank. The I.O.s are organized in two groups of 16 I.O. lines, which are connected using a 16 to 1 multiplexer which means the processor first sets the address for one line and then reads the input level of that line, then the next line is selected and so on. This process is repeated about 4000 times per second. To drive the reading process, I modified the sensor library of the DCC++X software so that it can read from the multiplexers. At first, I only got garbage from the inputs and as it turned out, there was another error in the board. I simply forgot to install pull-up resistors for the input lines, so the input signal was somewhat floating and giving all kind of readings. So I manually installed some pull-up resistors to 3.3V and the inputs started to work. And since I am using the original DCC++X software interface, Input status changes are automatically reported to the DCC++ API and from there to the stick and Loconet. And with that I knew that all function blocks are working as intended, so it was time to install the IBT2, connect the test track and the throttle and run the first train. The IBT2 is simply connected on the board with the 8-pin signal connector and then hooked up to 4 wires for DC and DCC and that's it. The huge capacitor and terminal block thereby fit into the board opening so that the final Red Hat housing will be relatively flat, with just the heatsink of the IBT2 sticking out a little bit. So here is the board sitting on the layout with the IBT2 and the IoT T-Stick installed. I connect it to a DC power supply with about 16 volts as it is normal for HO scale. When the power is switched on, the board automatically powers up, as does the attached IoT T-Stick and the throttle that is connected to Loconet. I now select the locomotive and turn the speed knob. The locomotive starts moving as expected. Slow down, change direction and increase speed again, 
works as well. So it appears that my first test of the board was quite successful. Of course, there is still some work to do to finalize the board. First, I came across some design errors and improvement opportunities, so I will make some changes to the PCB and order an improved test version, hopefully very close to the final design. Second, I need to work on some modifications to the DCC++ X software to support all functions of the board and the communication with the IoT stick. And third, there is work to do on the stick software to fully support the board, meaning programmable input addresses, programmable functionality of the LEDs, and so on. So stay tuned, more is coming. And if you don't want to miss it, subscribe to the IoTT channel, click the bell icon, and you are in a premium seat when the next prototype shows up in a video. And that's it for today. I hope this information was useful or at least interesting for you. If so, please click the like button below to let me know. Doing so helps to promote this video and the IoTT channel in general because YouTube likes the likes. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.